Johan Kaleman, if there is somebody inspiring in the, in the world of macrocosmic uh, quantum theories, that's you because you actually go in uh, what, what, that, what that is. So welcome to the, to the World Happiness Week and this World Happiness Fest. And as you know, we, we want to understand the opportunities and possibilities for world happiness from so many different angles. And what you've been doing for the last years is just is just remarkable. So thank you so much, Carl, for being part of the week. Thank you so much, Luis, uh, to you too. You know, I, I think this whole initiative of the World Happiness Foundation and setting that as one of the major uh, directions for uh, the, the work of humanity is, is really by itself quite revolutionary and, and uh, a very valuable uh, contribution to, to what we need to know and do at the current time. So thank you so much. Coming from you, uh, from somebody who understands quantum leaps, <laughs> uh, <laughs> is, is very, very important. So why don't we go deeper uh, into, uh, into what macrocosmic quantum theory is and what does it bring to the world today? Yeah. So, you know, quantum theory, uh, pretty much everyone has heard about it, at least uh, anyone who is interested in novel thinking of, of all kinds. Uh, but quantum theory in its uh, traditional form, which is microcosmic quantum theory, is now about 100 years old. And uh, for, for a long time, this was just a very fascinating subject for uh, physicists and chemists and people in the hard sciences. Um, you know, especially I, I would say that the uh, atom model uh, created by Niels Bohr in 1913, uh, with the whole idea that um, there are such things as quantum leaps, when it comes to the orbits of electrons uh, uh, revolving around the nucleus of an atom, that whole concept is, is really a little bit of a, of a miracle, something that we really can't grasp from our everyday experience of how uh, reality works. In other words, there is a shift, uh, oh, oh, sorry, there is a shift um, an instantaneous shift between the energy levels of um, electrons that takes place under certain conditions in, in, inside the electron. Now, since that time, since the initial pioneers worked with microcosmic quantum theory, um, it, it's, bro it's broadened uh, its appeal to people much far uh, outside of, of the actual uh, hard sciences where it was developed. And uh, in a, particularly in the past 20 years, uh, uh, there's been a lot of focus on, on it in, uh, among people that are interested in spirituality and consciousness. And uh, the reason is that there is, a, I think, a feeling that there is some kind of an underlying field to reality that um, uh, is provided by quantum theory, and that that underlying field is somehow connected to human spirituality uh, to, and to the divine uh, as such. And, uh, but the thing is, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a doctor of physical biology, so I have a background and have been teaching quantum theory in, on this microcosmic level uh, for a few years. And, uh, um, uh, what I have come to conclude uh, from, from my scientific uh, viewpoint is that what happens on a subatomic level really doesn't cover the, the, uh, uh, or provide any answers to the kind of questions that people are asking when it comes to the large scale evolution of consciousness in the universe. In other words, the, whatever happens on the microcosmic uh, quantum level is not really re relevant to uh, our own evolution and our own place in the world. 
to, it's not really relevant to the evolution of biological species. It's not really relevant to the evolution of um, uh, human history. Uh, and it's very many different aspects. And so based on this, and based on these in insights of, you might say the, that, that the microcosmic quantum theory doesn't cover a, a theory for the evolution of, of the universe. Uh, I have developed something called macrocosmic quantum theory. And um, this inspiration to this really came from the calendar system of the ancient Maya. And uh, it's, um, and not only from them, I should say, um, the, many of the concepts that we, we find from the Maya were shared in ancient times by many, many different uh, uh, civilizations. Uh, oh, oops. Um, um, and uh, 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 the, 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 what, but there is still something special about the Maya in, in this regard. Um, you know, you, you, can, you can go to say India or Egypt and you will find that they talked about cosmic serpents as major creation factors. The thing though, is that the Maya in contrast to all other uh, ancient civilizations, they developed a calendar system of the evolution of consciousness. And a calendar means that you have numbers. And once you have numbers, you really have an inroad to modern science. You, you will then have the possibility of, of see if, if your hypothesis actually matches not only your hypothesis, but the ancient Mayan calendrical system, whether it actually matches the evolution of history as we know it. And so that, that's the reason that I think the, the Maya are very, very special uh, because they, they give us a, a, a means of connecting our understanding uh, of the universe and all the modern database for uh, how it has evolved and connecting that with the ancient ideas of an evolving consciousness that typically was symbolized by the plumed serpent or serpents or dragons and these kind of movements of invisible forces. And so th that is um, in short, the background to developing uh, um, the, uh, uh, the, the macrocosmic uh, quantum theory. Uh, but, you know, the, the whole idea from the, the, the Maya that we get is that <clears throat> evolution of consciousness and it, meaning everything that happens in the universe is ultimately is a product of the evolution of consciousness. And that proceeds, as we can see on this uh, diagram, um, in a stepwise fashion. That's the reason that they built their py pyramids as terraces. So here you can see, if you climb this pyramid that you can see, you're actually climbing nine different levels of, of evolution, nine different waves, each of which provides a particular state of consciousness to the human mind. And so what you see here on, on, to the right is uh, only for the five highest waves, you see the corresponding states of consciousness. And uh, each one of them then has a particular uh, um, uh, uh, geometry. You can see there are crosses there that defines a particular geometry, but you might also see it as filters that determine what aspects of reality will you be able to perceive? How will you perceive it? How will you express it? How will you recreate it? And so forth. So because of this, people in different eras under the influence of different waves have 
created what you might say different worlds, different world ages. And I would say this has nothing to do, age, world ages has nothing to do with astrology. It's about the evolution of consciousness and not about the physical, um, uh, physical planets or, or, or something like that. Uh, quantum theory is not about uh, physics in the Newtonian sense of the word. Uh, quantum theory is about the underlying field. And then you can also see uh, to the right there that each of these waves, each of which creates a particular state of consciousness, uh, uh, is activated at specific points in time. And uh, 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 that is then really what, what determines the fact that we have a, a, a history, that we're not just standing in the same place uh, all the time. But as new uh, states of consciousness like this have been activated in the cosmos and made accessible to human beings, um, we have um, um, changed and evolved. And this is a long, long story presented in seven books of mine, and this, this is not the time to go into any kind of detail about it. But what I do want you to see in this particular slide is the fact that if you look at these five highest levels of consciousness, it, there is an overall pattern. The pattern is from unity in the light, that you can see in the fifth wave, through separation, through a sequence of different filters provided by the sixth and the seventh and the eighth wave, it's a return then to the ninth wave state of consciousness in the light, unified consciousness in the light. And so in this sense, unlike what many people might have heard, uh, the the Mayan calendar system provides a kind of overall direction for the evolution of, of humanity. It, uh, it tells us what states of consciousness are accessible to us. And then to some extent, or to a large extent actually, it's up to us to develop the means in order to access these different uh, consciousness. And to me, what, the only thing that makes sense is to uh, see this as a, a, a climb of, of, a, of, a, uh, of a cosmic evolution scheme, ultimately leading to the return of that state of unity on a higher level. So in this case, you. If we focus on consciousness, can, can you define what consciousness is for you and what is, what is the state of human consciousness today with respect to what it was a few hundred years ago and with respect to what it's going to be in a couple of hundred years from now? Yeah, well, uh, uh, to me, consciousness just means something like subjective experience or our, our ability to have a, a subjective experience. And uh, which means in other words, without consciousness, we would not exist as living beings really. So it's, it's just, it's almost like uh, synonymous with life, consciousness and life. But this um, ability to have this su subjective experience, that makes us feel that we are some, there is somebody in there, so to speak, in us, so to speak. Uh, um, uh, we, um, uh, it, it can take different forms. Uh, the, I think the universe begins with consciousness, really. And then it, it develops the material uh, universe uh, around itself. Uh, consciousness is primary to matter. And uh, <clears throat> as it does that, it also uh, it develops us into human beings uh, uh, eventually with, uh, with a more and more um, sophisticated 
uh, uh, ability to uh, experience difference through our senses, etc., etc. But it's not a it's not a sing, single straight uh, one consciousness. Uh, uh, as this picture shows, uh, there are several different states of consciousness, and each one of them means that we have different kinds of subjective experiences. And where we are now, um, I would say, is that especially then after March 9th, 2011, is that all of these nine levels of consciousness uh, are accessible. They, they have all been activated in the cosmos and became, become accessible to us human beings. But it's, it's not just then to say, okay, then we know that this or that will happen. Um, you know, the, it, it's a little bit different like that because first of all, the human beings need to uh, access the, these states of consciousness. And at the current time, all of these st states of consciousness are in principle running in parallel and accessible. And we need to, uh, um, to cultivate these states of consciousness. We, we, we need to develop the, the methods, you might say, or, and the intentions. Um, I, I would say if we want to follow the cosmic plan, we need to do in such a way that we actually access the, the highest level, the ninth way there, where there are no filters, where we do not project separation either to others or to ourselves. Um, and uh, it's not exactly because there is a human choice involved in how we relate to these different states. It's not just predictable exactly how, at least from this point in time, uh, how things will turn out. It, it will depend so much. All I can say is that you know, the, the purpose, as far as I can understand it, of this whole creation is for humanity to aim for that uh, unity state. And it's a happy state in the sense that it's not uh, creating separation. And it's a happy state in the sense that it doesn't mean that you project uh, dualities on other people and, and project uh, bad, good, et cetera, et cetera. It's, a, it's an accepting state because it is the light that comes through without any kind of, 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 of filter. Uh, but at this point, I, 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 I'm not saying that anything, you know, I, I'm not going into uh, saying this or that will happen. Um, I, it's, um, there is also, uh, uh, as we talked about before this interview, um, there is also a, a certain a timing of how these different uh, waves will play out. And so you can say that the accessibilities of states will uh, all be altered. The, uh, uh, the possibilities will be uh, different uh, in, in the times ahead. And, uh, you know, just rough, as a very rough uh, statement, I would say that there, there is still quite some tough times uh, uh, up until the year 2031, uh, where, where I think uh, th there will be new possibilities, uh, especially in the seventh wave, um, in, in order to uh, uh, return to a sound, uh, a sane and sound globality. Now, you know, not globality has got a bad uh, uh, reputation because people think that it's somebody who, who dominates everybody else. That's not what I mean. I, but my, my globality is, uh, is, is respect for all, uh, all traditions, all, all uh, nations and, and, and a willingness for all of them to merge in a sense and collaborate and, and so forth. And that possibility will increase in, in 2031. 
And uh, I, I would also say that uh, uh, there will be uh, uh, the possibility of uh, a sound uh, return to democracy that has suffered, I think, in, in the past couple of years. And, uh, but will this happen is another question. You know, it, it, it really is like quantum theory uh, and the possibilities of, of doing these kind of um, uh, quantum leaps. Quantum theory is really about possibilities and, and probabilities, you might say. It is not deterministic. And, and that's true. There are many, many parallels if you look at the macrocosmic quantum theory and microcosmic quantum theory. And one of these uh, parallels is the fact that, you know, it's not deterministic. It, it just uh, talks about different po uh, potentialities. And that's where we come in, we human beings. Well, this, this is so um, so helpful. Um, I'm, I'm a big follower and fan of David Bond with the infinite potential. So I think that uh, you are very much uh, linking this. And I would love to ask you a bit more about the elements of um, this macrocosmic uh, quantum theory, because basically what I see here is that these waves are coming from somewhere. And reading your books, that's coming from the heart of the universe, of the center of creation. Those waves are, from a symbolic point of view, it is a serpent, the plump serpent that the Mayas were talking about. So basically you are talking about the, the heart of creation, which is the, the, the tree of life. You are talking about the serpent, which are the waves, and then you incorporate another very important element, which is the duality and the concept of gene and Jan and the concept of a separation in many ways before the union. And something that we are learning a lot from many um, researchers and uh, experts in non-duality is that we are getting into an opportunity to get into non-duality when we understand how to get there. So can we, can you please go uh, farther and a bit deeper into the key elements of this theory? And then how do we, what do we do with that information? Because something else that you say is that our brain in this case are receptors of all these waves coming. So I think that you will incorporate really important elements that uh, can give us a new perspective, actually what you call a new um, a theory of biology and how humans are progressing in the world. So can we go a bit deeper about the elements, these elements? Yes. So, um... These are very big questions, and they, they, I have developed my, the answers that I'm giving to them uh, in, in a number of books, uh, um, you know, especially then the, the uh, quantum science of psychedelics, uh, which is not a, only about psychedelics. It has maybe the one third of psychedelics, but it really provides a model of the mind that, from which we can really understand uh, how psychedelics work. Uh, but, but it's also in the previous, the nine waves of creation. And, the, the, you know, we, we, we have these concepts from ancient times, uh, like the tree of life, as you mentioned. And, and to the Maya, sometimes that would be called the place of creation, or it would be called the heart of the heavens, or uh, something like that. And then we have uh, the, the serpent which is both the tree of life and the serpents are ubiquitous concepts. You, you hard pressed to find any culture on our planet from ancient times that did not have these as central uh, components of their uh, um, cosmologies. And then if you go to the average person in the, in the modern world, have no clue about this. And so either you have to say that the, the, the ancients did not, they were just superstitious idiots, they didn't know anything, or the truth is there is something we don't see. And that's what I believe. There, there, there is 
something we have not wanted to see uh, for whatever reasons. And we need to, in order to see this, we need to translate the ancient concepts into a little bit more modern language. And that's where quantum theory comes in, where you can, for instance, what you show, what I'm showing here is a picture from Dr. Singhal, uh, 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 who uh, made a very interesting study of the entire cosmos and the number of uh, quasars, which are huge uh, radiation sources on, on, a, on a large distance from, from uh, um, uh, ourselves. And uh, who found that, you know, if, if there is a line, if you put a line on, on something that, that's called the preferred axis in cosmology, uh, an axis that encompasses the entire uh, universe as we know it, then you found that there is a major uh, significant difference in the numbers of these on the one side of the universe uh, compared to the other side of the universe. And so there is what I would say an, an actual basis for the idea of a yang and a yin, a expansive hemisphere of the universe and a more a stable form of, uh, uh, of the hemisphere of the universe as we can say. And Yin and Yang then would get an explanation, uh, you know, especially if you look upon the Yin and Yang as being transferred step by step, uh, trickled down from this huge cosmic level that I just show you through the galaxy, down to the heliosphere, down to the planet, and down ultimately to ourselves, who are the receivers of this particular kind of polarity. And then by receiving through that reception, our perception of reality will change. Yin and Yang is a critical thing for all creativity. In, in, unless there was that kind of a distinction between the two hemispheres, everything would just be an amorphous mixture of, of nothingness, basically. But because that, uh, of that duality, there are things. We, we have a sort of a, a reality around us of, of, of all kinds of things, you might say. Now, this axis that was just recently, in 2004, I call that recently here, discovered by modern science through the satellites they've sent, sent out to measure the cosmic microwave background radiation. That if you just say that, hey, this is not just an axis, this is the tree of life, then things start to make sense. It's just a you just make that choice. You say, this is what the ancients talked about. This axis that separates the, the, the hemispheres of, of, of not only of the universe as such, but of the galaxy, of the planet, and, and of ourselves, then we will start to see how all of the, this universe has been created. And part of that is also then to look at the phenomenon of the um, of, of, of serpents. Uh, so, you know, serpents are, uh, exist in, in all kinds of traditions, and these are just examples of them. But uh, as the biblical story tells us, which I do believe is a kind of a little bit of politicized story, but still, the truth is the, uh, that the, the serpents are related to the tree of life. In many, many traditions, there are stories where uh, 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 trees of life and serpents are connected. And the serpents are simply uh, sine waves. They're these waves uh, are that, that are the tree of life is sending out and that we are receiving. And as we receive those, then we will also then have a, 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 a um, uh, change of mind, you might say. And what all this leads up to is that the mind, for instance, is not created by our brains, which is, you know, one of the big misconceptions of, of uh, modern science. Our minds are downloaded by our brains. 
And only as these waves called serpents by the ancients, what else could they call them, I should say? It, only as they are downloaded will, uh, to the brain will, will we have a, a mind. So it's an interesting, uh, uh, what should I say, synergy, you might say, between these waves and, and our brains that, that creates our minds. And then once you see that, you, you will also see the possibility of an evolution of consciousness. Because you know our, our our brains have the ability to download or, if you like, resonate with these different states of consciousness brought by the serpents. Well, um, when we look at the space of um, transformational technologies, right now technology is going so fast um, that. We have seen already sensors, we have already seen uh, wearables, and we've seen technology that is accelerating the access to all these reception of waves. Because if the brain is downloading, the, the more open we can be to that download, the easier it will be to elevate our consciousness. This is the way I'm, and I'm, and I'm understanding it. So yeah. technology at some point is really going to allow every human being to download as much as they can. So is this, is this right? And what is the limit to download yeah. consciousness? Yeah. Um, um, I don't know what the limit is, um, except that I think... Uh, Unity, a non-filtered state of consciousness, that is the ultimate, um, regardless of any technology. I, I think I, I tend to believe that is the ultimate. Um, and, and I think that, that's just what I want to uh, respond to that. Okay, because when we talk about technology, we, we talk about uh, not just uh, technical things, but we talk about meditation. So right now, meditation is becoming mainstream, uh, yeah. and, and people uh, start to know how to do that. Or we do drumming. We show many yeah. shamans. They use music, dancing, drumming. We see now that uh, psych psychedelics are being legalized in at least for some research after all what happened in the sixties and seventies. So I think I call that technology as well, is that okay. the, the opportunity it, for us to, to use it, tools that are gonna be helping us to expand the opportunity to get that consciousness. Okay, now I understand you better because I immediately thought about all the digital world and, and so forth when I, when I heard you say technology. But then, yes, uh, absolutely, as you're saying, there, there's been these, uh, 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 these tools, you might say, that have aided our access to, uh, especially then the ninth wave, the, the unity consciousness. And uh, that includes this whole range of, uh, um, what would you call these kind of technologies? Uh, uh, Psycho-spiritual technologies, maybe. Uh, in, that would be like meditation, like yoga, like breath work, like psychedelics. And, and they're all really modalities, I think, of, of, uh, of techniques that, uh, that could help you to, uh, uh, um, to disengage uh, the kind of dualist mind that was created by, especially then the, one of these waves, the sixth wave, uh, that, that, that was really what gave people the structured mind and allowed us to uh, create uh, um, uh, uh, civilizations uh, with, with a, a particular mindset and so forth. And, uh, you know, I, I would say that there are good sides to civilization. There certainly have been good sides to civilization. 
but there have also been negative sides because that, that kind of a mindset that, that created the civilization has been very much dualistic, has been very much based on separating the rulers and the ruled, the, the, the good and the bad, the so-called good and the so-called bad, and, and really making separate uh, uh, human beings. And uh, <clears throat> now, so if it's possible to disengage that kind of a duality, at the level where we have now climbed to on the cosmic pyramid, if, if you like. If it's possible to disengage that, then uh, those techniques, the, the ones that we just mentioned, the, 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 the psychedelics, the meditations, the yogas, the breath work, and, and a couple of other th things like that, like drumming or uh, more connected to the earth and, and so forth, but still, that would sort of facilitate. It wouldn't immediately give us the access to the ninth wave or, or that unity state of consciousness, but it would facilitate our climb to that level. And uh, uh, th that is an important aspect of, of our own time, that these phenomena have become so much mainstream, some of them at least, uh, uh, that, that um, uh, people are in principle have many of the tools required to, for, for this ultimate uh, quantum leap. I, I have a, um, a follow-up question, or probably the last question, uh, about one topic that we haven't talked yet, but I think is a, is a byproduct of some of the waves. And I would love to, uh, to understand a bit more is the concept of ego and the concept of ego related to duality. Because at some point when you talk about this ninth wave and the concept of unity, it has a lot to do with the concept of ego. Can, we, can, can you explain a bit more uh, what, where is the ego coming from? And what is the role <laughs> of this ego into human evolution? Yeah, okay, let's see. Am I so lucky that I have one of the pictures for that? Um, no, it doesn't seem I'm that lucky. So anyway, um, uh, first of all, what is not the ego? The ego is not a, a, a part of our brain or, or some, some, some kind of function that is a, a natural constituent of, of, of our brains. Uh, it is something that has developed over time. And it is something that has developed um, um, as, uh, uh, as a function of these different waves. Um, so, you know, for, for, for instance, one of the interesting things that you can uh, understand by following uh, the, how humans have looked upon themselves over time, uh, for over the past 100,000 years, is that Initial, the, the initial forms of art that we know humans have produced, like the cave paintings in Spain and, the, and France, um, they, uh, they don't show a lot of humans. In, in fact, you know, you'll have to look for humans anywhere. And then, you know, from 10,000 years on, um, there, you're starting to see human beings portrayed on cliff sides and so forth, but they're not very personalized, individualized. They certainly don't look like rulers or, any, or anything like that. But you're starting to see humans are starting to develop some kind of a, a self-awareness. And then comes the sixth wave activation that took place in, in 3200 BC and led to the creation of civilizations typically ruled by some kind of a, a pharaoh or, or king or, or something like that. And then a process starts where uh, um, the, the human individual, and, and then in particular, certain ones uh, are, are, uh, are developing a personality trait, I, I would say, that is a function of this duality, this separation between rulers and ruled. And, and so the, the, the waves, uh, the wave at that time allowed human beings to, to 
create a dominance aspect of themselves. And that ultimately led to you know, a, spe a specific uh, function uh, of, of the mind created by these waves that created people that have big egos, uh, dominance aspects. And, you know, you can discuss that, you can point out that in, in the kind of world people have been living in the past 5,000 years, there has been some kind of a value to having that kind of a, uh, aspect of, of, of your mind. But on the other hand, in, in the large scale of things, it is not, uh, certainly at this point, is not a very good thing for humanity at large. And, and uh, if anything, wh where we need to go is to, to uh, uh, jointly access the ninth wave in such a way that we find that we actually have the ability to tune in to the very same uh, unity consciousness, all of us, really, not and, and not just sort of, I do my own thing, or uh, as, as we mostly do at the current time. And that's really the, the great uh, danger. And, uh, you know, the, uh, thinking about the, this uh, capitalism that, that, that you're uh, calling about, uh, you know, we've had this idea that I'll be happy on my own. You know, I, I know I, I will find that way myself, how, how to create happiness for myself. And that is not a, a constructive a, a point of departure at our current time. We will have to seek to develop such a capitalism on uh, together. And uh, uh, which, you know, it, I, you know, you can't just slay the ego as the, the ancient uh, Eastern traditions would say, but we can develop the higher uh, levels of consciousness to such a way that the ego uh, gets an increasingly less power over ourselves. Well, I think that, uh, Dr. Kaliman, we could be talking for days. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's amazing. I mean, all your books bring a, another level of insight. Uh, and very practical at the same time. So I think that your contribution to, to human progress is just incredible. So I want to say thank you uh, very much because uh, what you are doing is, is remarkable. And I appreciate very much that you can share this with, with all of us. Uh, do you have a final uh, recommendation for people who want to navigate in the right way, the ninth wave and all the others? Because we have nine waves actually working at the same time right now for the first time in human history, right? Yeah. Well, thank you very much for, for having me. It's been a pleasure. And I, I, I really, there is something profoundly inspiring by the kind of uh, projects that you, you are, are working with. Um, and, um, you know, may, maybe the, the uh, uh, maybe the ultimate, uh, goal or direction for for ourselves and the current time is really happiness and not unity or uh, uh, or or anything like that but but unity will will be a necessary component in order to forge that uh, happiness that uh, you know everyone is uh, in, in aspiring to at the current time um, I don't, uh, you know, I, I think I really covered what 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 I wanted to say at uh, in those final remarks. Uh, I do want to, you know, just continue a little bit, maybe, and strengthen my point when it comes to this issue of the ego and so forth. Uh, in other words, uh, if you uh, uh, look, I, I think I and I will allow myself to show another to come back to. Uh, where do we have it? Oh, there we go. Um, uh, so you know, just to the to look at to the right there. Um, or maybe you're not seeing. Let's see. Are you sharing? No, I'm not sharing. Right. Sorry. No, you you stop sharing. You have to share again. Yeah, I have to share the screen. Okay. 
Okay. So uh, here we go again with this. So uh, where we are now, and, and it's a lot of history, as you can see, this goes back, the, the five levels here goes back 100,000 years. And then it covers the historical evolution of humanity, the 5,000 years, and then a couple of others. Now, the eighth wave is, was activated only in 1999. So a lot of people have lived through that. And you know the most obvious um, uh, expression of it is the dig digitalization of the world and, and the new world created by that. And then uh, the, the ninth wave was much more recently activated in, in 2011. What I do want to say here is, is the, uh, there is a, what's a, a risk, you might say, by, by this eighth wave. As you can see, that is, you know, it, you might say, yes, it's created an interesting world of, of a, a digital phenomena. Uh, it's actually helped the, the right brain have to come forth, uh, meaning uh, um, meditation, psychedelics, uh, uh, breath work, and, uh, and all that kind of thing. It certainly has helped uh, that strengthening of the right brain half certainly has strengthened the roles of, of women in the world and, and so forth. So, uh, you know, it, it does provide for some kind of a background to the potential quantum leap to the unity of the ninth uh, uh, wave. But it does also create almost like a seductive individualism. The, the, the very fact that it's a dualist wave makes people, uh, it, it simply makes them separate. And, and we can easily see that through the digital world that, that it creates a lot of, of, of separation and especially at the current time. So I do wanna emphasize here that Nobody gets to the ninth wave without doing a quantum leap. Uh, something have to go into some different state of, of uh, uh, functioning. And that, that way of functioning is not just about my individual ex development into you know, some kind of a spiritual master or, or whatever it is that, that some people are aspiring to. No, the quantum leap to the ninth wave, it requires that you, first of all, an intention to sort of harmonize yourself truly and very directly with this particular cosmic influence and do that jointly with other people, not mm -hmm. just Oh, it's my development. No, it's not my development. This is for all. And it has to be, you know, not a, not a surrendering, um, sorry, not, not a surrendering. Uh, 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 it has to be done by surrendering to this field, not a surrendering to uh, some kind of powerful individual or guru or, or whatever. It is surrendering to a cosmic, non-human, but divine field. And if we can do that jointly, uh, then we will be part of the final quantum leap to, 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 uh, that might re restore happiness to humanity. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more and I feel it. And, and I think that, as you know, we are going today, we are going through the uh, through the biggest pandemic of loneliness in the world. We know that. Uh, and we know about these three levels of separation, separation with self, separation with communities, separation with nature and beyond. So I feel that uh, your message is very, very important. And, and, I would, and I would say that actually what we are doing with this uh, festival, with the foundation and everything is to join forces because we know that collective trauma requires collective healing. So I think that your theory really reinforces that mm -hmm. we have to go into collective healing. Yeah. yeah. So thank you so much, uh, Professor Dr. Kalaman. It's a pleasure, and um, we'll, we'll keep the conversation um, going forward. 
with, yeah. with many more things, I'm sure. Thank you so much for joining Thank us. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. My pleasure.